everyone here. Welcome to ROM Hacking to Fan Translate a Video Game. Or if you're looking at the program slash the screen out there, it's ROM Modding. And that's because I'm, uh, I'm not allowed to say hacking in the, in the program guide. Um, I was told that last year, so I just, okay, yeah, sure. I'm a ROM modder now. Um, so, uh, let's just get into it. Um, if my computer, yeah, there we go, awesome. So, uh, this is just a table of contents for the talk. Um, introduction is going to be about five minutes, that's what I'm talking now. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got into ROM hacking followed by uh, about 40 minutes of me talking about uh, two of the games that we're working on, uh, my team is. Uh, and then followed at the end is there, there's gonna be Q&A. So as you notice, Q&A at the end. Um, so if you don't mind, please hold your questions. Uh, just write them down in your phone or something like that. And at the end, you can come up and ask them. Uh, I have 10 minutes down. I don't know that my total content length is going to be all the way um, there, so it might be a little bit more. So you might have time for more questions, which is great, actually. Um, so next up, as I mentioned, for those of you who attended the talk last year, this talk is reloaded. Um, so all new content, what's this? I don't know. You're going to have to stick around to find out. Uh, exciting, exciting. About 90% new content, basically. So some of it's familiar. Uh, especially towards the beginning, you'll notice, um, if you were here last year, but it goes off the rails real quick. Hopefully in a controlled way, though. Um, all right. Uh, so last year I gave this talk three times, uh, once at SoccerCon and once at Geek Girl Con here in Seattle, and then also at Retro World Expo in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, and I just realized I need to start recording. Okay. Uh, I'm now recording. Awesome. Uh, so last year, I get, yeah, anyway. All right, my talk in Hartford was actually recorded, uh, which is what just reminded me <laughs> to do that. Um, and I've uploaded it to my YouTube channel. Uh, this year, I wanted to mix things up and talk about different stuff. So if you're interested in learning more, I highly recommend you check out the recording of the previous panel. Here is a, okay, come on, come here. Okay, there we go. Here is a QR code you can scan if you want to add it to your watch later real quickly. I will leave that up on the screen as I see people with their phones out scanning that QR code. Look, I have a little YouTube logo in the center. It turns out that like most QR code generators online that are free make you sign up for an account if you want to do that. So I had to go through like four to get the YouTube logo. It was great. Um, all right, awesome. It looks like most everyone has scanned it that wants to scan it. Um, so I'm going to move right along here. All right, everyone. So hello, my name is Jonko. I am the project lead at the Haruhi Translation Club, uh, which is the little group that I have that translates video games. Um, here's a couple of things just about me that make me well suited to this particular disposition. Uh, I'm a software engineer. I'm studying Japanese, which really helps when you're translating games from Japanese. I apparently have a high tolerance for really tedious things. Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, so <laughs> moving along. Uh, so we're just going to go real quick into what goes into a fan translation, all right? So the first thing is pretty obvious. It's translation. Um, basically, you have to have people that are capable of speaking and reading whatever language you're translating the game from and taking that and putting it into your target language. Um, next up, we have graphics. So most of the text in the game is going to be in text, but a lot of it happens to be in uh, images. So you can see here we have uh, some lovely image modification that one of our guys did uh, where we took this uh, top image with a, a classroom sign and we turned it into the bottom image that's fully translated. Looks great. Um, so that way when people come across in the game, they can read it. Um, next up, you have access to the game's uh, binary, the final form of it, but you don't have access to the game's source code. So you're going to want to modify the, the, the game itself, and so you need people who can take the uh, low, low, low level code that is actually in the binary and modify that. Um, so that's what ROM hacking is, um, and that's what I do. Um, so then finally, this is one of the more accessible roles, uh, but basically you need people who can look over the script. Uh, say, for example, that your main and uh, like fantastic translator is British um, or Australian. Um, 
just hypothetical examples, and they keep uh, putting like you know mate or something in there uh, for like when you're mean like friend or whatever you know like that kind of stuff or uh, oi or something like that. Anyway, uh, just random British expressions. You need people that can look at those and turn them into uh, nice American English if that's your target, um, which is ours. Uh, we decided that like by consensus because the light novels are translated into American English, so that's why we did it that way. Had they been British, we would all be saying. Oi, mate. Uh, anyway, um, so then also testing the game for bugs and such is also important. These are, if you're looking to get started and you uh, don't really have, like, you don't speak another language or you don't have, like, good Photoshop skills, this is a great place uh, to be able to contribute. We're always needing people who can do this kind of stuff, uh, especially testing. is always hard to find people willing to play the whole game all the way through. So super useful. Definitely recommend getting started there if you'd like to. Um, so while all these roles are necessary, the one I'm going to be focusing on for this talk is ROM hacking, uh, because uh, that's the title of the talk. So uh, basically to get into that, I need to uh, briefly answer a very important question for the people that are non-technical in the audience. How does computer work? All right. So everything on a computer is ultimately represented by switches, uh, which we call bits. And they are either on, one, or off, zero. That's what binary is. So if you've seen the matrix, exactly like that. Um, so the components of binary, the basic component is what's called a byte. We basically take eight of those bits and we shove them together and we have each one represent a, uh, uh, a place uh, in the number system. So that we get a number between zero and 255, that's the range of a byte. And so if you've ever heard of hexadecimal, um, that's how we talk about bytes because we end up taking these, um, rather than using zero through nine, we use zero through F um, and it lets us take the 0 through 255 and represent it with only two characters um, for that whole range. And so that's why we try to do it that way. Um, basically, then, you can also take larger numbers and make larger numbers out of these. Um, and there's a couple ways of representing them. Uh, one way that you see in a lot of uh, some architectures is called big endian. This is like basically how we would normally read the number. So you can see here we have 102, which corresponds to 258. In binary, we represent that uh, with 00000102. But there's another way of representing it, which is called little endian. And that's basically we do it backwards. I mention this because it's important because uh, the DS's architecture, which is the first game we're going to talk about, uses little endian. So when you're looking at some of my screenshots, you'll see, why are those numbers backwards? Uh, this is why. Um, so that's, uh, that's basically for that, uh, what we're talking about there. Um, but bytes can also be used to represent other things, like letters. So if you ever heard of ASCII, like as a kid you like did like ASCII encoding and things like that, that's what this is. Um, so basically every single uh, letter is represented by a uh, number um, or a series of numbers in the case of some of the larger encodings, like for example, Shift JIS, the Japanese encoding uh, that was used at the time that these games that I'm gonna talk about were created. Um, and finally, you can even represent machine code with bytes. So for example, this right here is a series of bytes that represents this particular instruction. And so that's what assembly is, and that's what we work with when we're ROM hacking. Because again, we don't have access to source code, higher level languages, we're working with this kind of stuff. So. Now that everyone uh, has my degree, oh wait, I don't have a degree, I just mentioned that. Uh, now that everyone uh, has a great understanding of computer science, uh, we're gonna get into the prehistory. This is how I got into ROM hacking. So uh, there is a purpose to diving into this, which is that I had a pretty gentle learning curve getting into this. I basically picked some really easy games at the start uh, to hack. And so this will serve as a pretty nice introduction for some of the stuff we're gonna talk about later on. So. Uh, who here knows what Onagai My Melody is? Show of hands. We have like five. Awesome. So uh, who knows what Hello Kitty is? Oh, there we go. Okay, so Hello Kitty is in the same property line as Onagai My Melody. Um, and basically, in 2020, I joined an anime subtitling group. Not a lot was going on. So, you know, I had a lot of free time and I was like, hey, why not subtitle some anime? Uh, one of the projects that we were working on was an anime called Onagai My Melody. Uh, so in one day in early 2021, I was just kind of searching around on the internet and found out that there was a My Melody Nintendo DS game that had never been translated. So on a whim, I decided to spend some time figuring out how to edit it. The game is mostly a platformer, but it has a bunch of cutscenes like this one. 
uh, that I wanted to translate. So I opened up the game in Crystal Tile 2, uh, which is this program right here. Don't worry about why it looks like that. Um, but uh, basically, it's a general purpose toolkit for hacking DS games. But it does have some useful features that apply to any platform. But relevant here, it has this nice little file viewer that lets you see um, all of the DS game's internal file system, um, which is super helpful. So I cracked it open looking for script files, and look at this. There's a little folder here labeled script. I wonder if that contains the script files. So I just popped in, opened up the very first file, and look at that. The text from the game that we saw earlier and the text in the file, exactly the same. Amazing. So uh, I was like, hey, why not try changing it to something like, I don't know, Hello SakuraCon? And we've hacked our first ROM. Amazing. So very simple. All we did was we just like went into the little hex editor. We changed a couple of uh, bytes, saved the game, loaded it back up, and the game has different text now. So pretty simple. Um, but there were other files in that folder we were just seeing. So that first one was this .htx, but there's also this next one here that's .scr. And so I was like, oh, well, you know, why not pop that one open and see what it does? Okay, that's a bit more intimidating at first because uh, there's no like obvious text or anything like that. But we can start here by looking for patterns. So the first thing I noticed is that there's a bunch of these two threes all throughout the file. Uh, with the number of them and how they're spaced apart, it's possible that they're acting something like delimiters, uh, telling us that a chunk of something like code or something starts or stops somewhere. If we wanted to confirm that, we could try changing one and seeing what happens, but I know that uh, nothing really interesting happens and we're pressed for time, so we're going to move on and just change this second byte here. So currently it's 1B. We're going to change it to this next uh, version right after the next 2-3 and make it also 1-3. We save the game, we load it up, and the background's different. Oh my god, it's all pink. Amazing. So uh, maybe this command or this... Uh, thing, I don't know its command yet, this thing that I just edited, maybe it controls the background somehow. So I'm going to go back, I'm going to change it back to 1B, and then I'm going to change this next value, this 1 here, I'm going to make that a 2. And then when I save the game and load it up, it loads a different background into the game. So just by trial and error, just changing some random stuff and seeing what happens, I'm able to deduce that these SCR files are a controller for the script. There's a series of commands, and literally to get this chart that you see here, I just went and I just kept changing things over and over again to see what would happen next. Um, and uh, iterating on that, I was able to then write a program that was capable of parsing the script, uh, which looked like this. Uh, and then I was able to create something a um, little neat. Maybe? Is the sound going to play? Yes, no? No? Okay, there is sound. Uh, do we have, is my, I don't think it's my connection. I can hear it quietly, I think it's really quiet. It's just really quiet. Here, I'll turn up the volume. Oh. Sorry. Sorry about that. No, no, you're good. Is there an audio cable, like an audio jack nearby? Um, there's, here, I've got, I've got this guy right here. This is the audio jack plugged into me. Um, Do I not have it like fully in or something? No, it looks like it's about as in as go. Um, mm. Okay. I, I won't get out. Yeah, 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 that's fine. I, I can keep going in the meantime. Don't worry about it. Okay, so anyway, if you weren't paying attention to that uh, because the audio thing happened, it was a really cute little video where I said hi to Sakura Khan uh, with the My Melody characters. Adorable. Uh, if we uh, have time at the end, I will play it again if the audio gets fixed. Okay. Um, so that's kind of neat, I'm thinking to myself. We can basically translate this game now. There's still a few hiccups, like the fact that it's difficult to fit text in the text box in a sensible way, but that's okay. Problem is that I needed a translator, and the one I had uh, didn't end up coming through. So I moved on to a couple of other projects, just kind of picking stuff up randomly here and there. Uh, and one of them, I actually translated a, uh, an Italian Sailor Moon game fully. Um, but then I stumbled across, uh, across a forum post asking for help translating this game based on a series that sparked my love for anime as a young middle schooler. Um, and so... We moved on to the main series. In case you're not caught up to date on the hottest game of 2024, the 2009 Japan-exclusive Nintendo DS game, Suzumi Haruhi no Chokoretsu, I thought I'd show some gameplay here to get us all on the same page. So, 
Uh, real quick, again, uh, no audio, but that's okay. We're just going to play through the video. I'm going to commentate. So we have some logos at the beginning. Amazing. Uh, the next thing that you would see here um, is the OP for the game, uh, the opening uh, theme song and video. And uh, really cool, it has an original theme uh, that is uh, sung by the voice actors of the game. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's, it's great. It's a banger. Trust me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so then we go in here, we can see we have some graphics, so we have this title up here, but a lot of the stuff is actually already in English, like the episode, new game, all that kind of stuff, um, but most of it's in Japanese. Um, so then we have our boy Kyon. How many people have seen Haruhi, by the way? Wow, okay, we got some Haruhi fans in the house. Our boy Kyon is really exasperated, that's why he's going to sigh there, um, and he's going to go through and start his opening monologue. Uh, he loves monologuing, that guy. Um, and so... Uh, this actually is interesting because I searched a lot for this text initially, but it's all images, so I spent a bunch of time trying to find it, and it was a waste of time. <laughs> so I had to get it later with images. Now we get into the main game. The opening is actually voiced. So the opening and ending of each episode are voiced, which is kind of cool. Um, the middle parts are not. Uh, but basically, uh, we see some Japanese text going by, Haruhi is talking, good stuff. This is what the game looks like. Now we're all on the same page. Uh, you know, I mean, if you weren't already up to date with, as I said, the hottest game of 2024. Um, so, okay. So here's the deal. Uh, basically, um, I did a bunch of work on this game. Um, and uh, the first thing that you want to do when you start working on a game that you want to translate is you want to figure out how to edit the script files, right? You want to be able to change the text that's in the other language and turn it into the language that's your target. So, we're going to start with the script files. Just like with Onagai My Melody, the first step is identifying what the script files are, uh, which is something that I talked a little bit about uh, last time I did the talk. Um, so we're going to, like, suffice it to say, I managed to find the file that corresponds to that first uh, script in the game I just showed you. Uh, the very first one where Haruhi is talking. So, let's open it up. Here it is in all its glory. Okay, um, actually, it's a, it's a slightly larger... Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so anyway, the file is actually seven kilobytes, which in the scope of things is not that large in the gigabyte terabyte era, not that even that big. Um, but it's a lot more intimidating than the Onagai My Melody files were. But don't worry, for this we can remember another one of my rules of ROM hacking. You don't need to understand everything to change what you need. So, let's look for stuff that we want to change. We can clearly see that the text uh, at the beginning of the game that we just shot, saw does show up in the file, right? So, um, however, if the, the proper translation for this line is, it's time for the SOS Brigade Summer Training Camp Part 2. The original line has 13 characters, and the new line has 59. So to make this replacement, we're going to need to expand this line that you see above here. So if we do that, it ends up looking something like this. We put in the new text, uh, but then if you save that and load the game up like we did with Onagai My Melody, uh, the game crashes. So that's kind of weird. We're doing something wrong, but what is it that we're doing wrong, right? Um, well, let's try thinking about, bear with me with this metaphor, let's try thinking about the file like a neighborhood where each dialogue line is a little house. Uh, I love PowerPoint. This is, this is the icon that was available to me, so <laughs> this is what I use. Um, so I have a couple of houses labeled here. These are their little addresses, right? So basically the, the DS's computer is going to try to navigate this neighborhood. In order to display a particular line of text at a particular time, it needs uh, for us to tell it, here's the address where that house is, where that dialogue line is. Um, and so the way they do that uh, when they are programming things is you provide a map for the computer, um, which is exactly what the, the devs of Chokoretsu did. In computing, we use these things called pointers, which act like a, exactly what I just described, the map for the file for the computer. At the very top of the file here, uh, we have a couple of numbers, like for example, this one, E4. Now, this number here points to the 228th byte, which is the decimal of E4 in the file, which for the sake of our metaphor, we'll just say that's this blue house right here, okay? Um, and then I've also added a couple of other little arrows pointing uh, for other little pointers in this uh, top of the file here, okay? So, 
extending the neighborhood metaphor. Let's say we want to widen the blue house, a normal thing you do with houses. Um, if we do that, it's going to smash into the next house, right? So we have to move all of the other houses to the right. Again, a normal thing you do with houses. Um, so, metaphor is a little strained, I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, so basically, um, when we move the houses here though, right? Our map that we had before is suddenly wrong. This EC pointer here is now pointing to the house uh, to the left of the EC house. And this 1971 is pointing to the pavement in between these two houses. So essentially what happens here is that this is why the game is crashing. Um, we miss the step of changing all the pointers to point to the co correct locations afterwards. So essentially what's happening here is the game is saying, hey, uh, or we're saying, hey game, here's the EC house. And it's saying, oh great, uh, random pavement or random other thing here and I can't load it, I crash. That's essentially what's occurring. So um, basically we need to first find every single pointer in the file. We need to find and build the map of the file. That's a task I detail in my blog post about the subject and is way too technical for going into this. It would be a lot of just numbers on the screen. Um, so if you're interested in that, go uh, take a look at my blog and I'll detail that. Uh, but then it's time to uh, start working on a program to expand these dialogue lines. Um, and okay, I, I forgot that I had this part there. But anyway, that's what it looks like when we expand the text like we did the house. Okay, cool. Um, anyway, so we're going to write some code first uh, that helps the computer understand the map we just found. And it will make a little parser that looks something like this. Again, I love WPF for those of you familiar. Um, so then we just have to make sure uh, we have the logic for shifting all the pointers around when we edit the dialog line and we can fully insert the text we need into the game. Uh, and it looks beautiful. It looks just like that. Um, so again, I want to go back here real quick and talk about how big the file is, right? So what we've done here, we don't understand the vast majority of this file. Oh, audio, perfect, thank you. Yeah, I don't know, it's just uh, not playing for some reason. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I know, it was working a second ago, I have no idea. Of course. Yeah, happens. Um, okay. So we don't understand the vast majority of this file. All we've done is find a map within it and manage to adjust it. But all that really matters is that we understood enough to edit it for our purposes. And it turns out we didn't even need that much to do that. Uh, so anyway, now we've got a system for replacing the dialogue. There's a bit more to it actually because we have to automate the flow for the translators. Uh, but that's basically how we reverse engineer a file like that. At the top though, I mentioned that most of our text is in text but some of the text is tied up in graphics. So let's talk about that a little bit. So some of our graphics are very straightforward. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, yeah, what's, oh, sorry, yes. Uh, it's just. I'll try again, yeah. Okay, real quick, guys, I'm gonna have to, yeah, I can do that. Okay, one second. Make sure your audio is coming out headphones. Yeah, it is. Um, it's on uh, this guy. Do I need to press this button maybe? The headphones button, and that might do it. Yeah, try that. Okay, we'll try that. Good. Okay, there we go. We got it. Thank you. Okay. I don't know why my computer switched it, but <laughs> right, right. yeah, whatever. So it's okay. working now. It's working now. Seems to be okay. Well, and if it stops working again, I can change it back. So awesome. Okay, we're gonna go back and watch the videos at the end of the talk. It will be really fun. We're gonna love it. Awesome. Okay. So um, okay. So anyway. Uh, some of our graphics are, uh, blah, 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 blah. okay, here we go. Some of our graphics are very straightforward to translate. Um, they require Photoshop skills, obviously, um, but the basic loop is that you extract the graphic from the game and then you do your Photoshop magic and it ends up looking like that. So you can see we have all this nice text up here. We have lunchtime and we turn it into Cafe Dream, the, the famous uh, cafe from Haruhi Suzumiya, for those of you who, uh, there's a lot of people in the audience, so some of you might remember. Um, but not every single graphic in the game has this easy one-to-one -one correspondence. So for example, we're going to take a look at this graphic next, um, which this one says uh, Ashidome Chansu, which roughly translates to delay chance, as in chance to delay something, right? 
However, it's not stored as a graphic that simply looks like this. Rather, each character from this image is, or from this image rather, is cut and pasted from the image to make the final words. So you can see I've drawn a lot of arrows. I'm an artist. Um, but basically, we have every single little character in there in that tile is then taken out and uh, cut together to make this image. So if we straightforwardly just try to translate the top image into English like this, uh, we end up with uh, problems. Um, that doesn't look quite right. Um, so we're going to do a bit of a jump here because uh, the journey for figuring out these layouts actually started with the second game that we're trying to translate, Suzumi Haruhi no Hevetsu for the Wii, which at this point we'd been picked, we picked up and begun work on. Coincidentally, uh, this game had a similar problem that ended up being the key to solving this one. So, the main menu of, Haru, of Heiretsu um, uh, has this little text right here um, that says, a, but, a botan o oshite kurasai, or press the A button. However, when we tried to replace this with English text, it ended up looking really jank like this. So, um, kind of weird, we, I said about trying to fix that. Um, so basically, with Heiretsu, um, it groups its files and organizes its files in a way that's very different from Chokoretsu. The main archive structure in Heiretsu groups all the files by scene. So essentially, every file relevant to a scene ends up in a single subfolder. That means that whatever was affecting this press the A button graphic was probably in the same subfolder as these other files here. So again, like we have all of the graphics right here. Um, which is folder 4002 by its internal naming logic. As it turns out, most of the files in this folder are images, but the first one that wasn't was file number 10. So that became my target. I popped that file open, and to be honest, not a lot to work with here, right? There's no obvious text, just a ton of numbers. So the next step I took was I was like, okay, let's just see what this actually does in the game. So I decided to search for this file in the game's memory. The emulator for the Wii games, uh, Dolphin, has a fantastic extension that lets us do this really easily. So I found the file in memory and uh, just started editing some of the values. So for example, I started with changing uh, this little 280, which I know is small, but just trust me, that's what it says. Um, and we're going to change it to 200. And when we do that, as you can see, Ooh, it stretches. So um, for whatever reason, it's stretching the image here. So then I was like, okay, well, let's try something else. Let's try changing this next 280 to 200. Ooh, now it's cropped in some way. Uh, it's not stretched anymore, but the edge of the screen here is cropped off. Um, and so then the next thing I did was I was like, ooh, let's try changing these next little values here for fun. Oh my God, it's tinted now. Oh, beautiful. And it's a lovely tint, one of my favorite colors. Um, so basically when we're looking at here is, uh, I'm figuring out how this file is actually structured and what all of these little pieces of it do. Again, just trial and error, just like I did with Onagai My Melody. So again, I have a similar chart to what happened with Onagai My Melody, where I just went through trial and error and figured out what each part of this file did. And uh, basically what happens is this layout system takes a series of little textures of Im images that it takes in and it just crops out sections of them and puts them on the screen in certain, uh, uh, certain height and width specifications. So the important thing to note here is that a lot of these values, okay, three of them, are still unknown. So even though I don't understand the file fully, I'm still able to change it um, even, uh, blah, 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 sorry, even though I don't only, uh, fully understand the file, I'm still able to change it to do what I need it to do. Um, so I actually was able to create a little editor that looks really complex but does work. And eventually, I got something working, that original graphic. It says delay chance. And I even highlighted it here for you so you can see uh, that I initially cut these parts of the textures. I didn't even bother doing it by letter like the original one was doing. I just cut out the whole word and then just put it on the screen like this. Um, pretty cool. So um, that's how we do uh, graphics, basically, for uh, Chokuretsu. Now, I talked a little bit about Heiretsu, and to be honest, I don't have a great transition here. I just really wanted to talk about the next thing, so we're just going to jump right in because we're working on Suzumi Haruhi no Heiretsu. Um, so here's the thing with Heiretsu. Oh, you guys like that? Okay, good. I'm glad. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah, that's a reference. Uh, so, okay. So to translate a game, as I mentioned, you want to translate the graphics. This includes the title of the game, obviously, which you can see right here on the main screen. Uh, we have the title of the game, Suzumi Haruhi no Hiretsu. Now, as we saw a couple slides ago, this is a static image texture. So that's going to be pretty easy for us to edit. However, there's another place that the title of the game shows up, which is right before the title screen. And now this has audio, so you'll be able to hear it. Probably. Yes, excellent. Okay, that's really loud, isn't it? Okay. Oh boy, all the letters just flew in individually. And then they're all gonna fly out in a second. Okay, so interesting, right? Very, very interesting there. So what's going on here? Well, uh, basically what happened is that uh, that image that you saw there, that uh, title screen, every single individual character was a 3D model that's individually animated for that scene. And so they all flew in and then they all flew out. So what does that mean? If we want to translate that, we have to reverse engineer this game's 3D models. Oh boy, here we go. So step one of trying to reverse engineer a game's 3D models is to Google around to see if anyone has any made, it, made any progress reverse engineering that game's 3D models. <laughs> Uh, as luck would have it, a hacker named Mario Kart 64 had done some work on the game already and created an importer for 3DS Max. 3DS Max is a proprietary program that is not cheap, so thankfully my girlfriend happened to have a student subscription she was willing to share with me. Um, so I started experimenting with a script. Now we have to keep in mind something, which is what Mario Kart 64 notes here. Importer is incomplete, only imports base geometry, and only works on character models. Notably, textures are absent from this description. Uh, it seems that the image you see here had textures applied manually after the fact. So I messed around with this script, and uh, the good thing about it was that it gave me a really nice primer on how 3D models work, which I will now impart to you. So, here we go. An animated 3D model has four main components. The first is its geometry, or mesh. Take your guesses as to what this uh, model is now. Write them down, and uh, there are no prizes. But... Um, Basically, the geometry or mesh is composed of um, the vertices, which are the points in 3D space, um, and the faces, which are descriptions of how those points are connected, which you might have also heard of called polygons. Um, the next thing that makes, uh, uh, makes up the model is the skeleton, or armature. Um, this is the bones, uh, which are the core animatable components of the model. All of the vertices have weights for the bones that say how much they should deform when that bone moves, which allows the model to be animated. Next are the textures. Who guessed? Who got it correct? Oh, we got like a couple people. Excellent. Great. Um, so next is the uh, blah, 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 blah. next is the textures, which overlay on top of the mesh to actually give the model well texture. And finally, there's the animation, the part where we describe how each bone rotates, scales, and moves for each keyframe, which is actually what allows the model to move around in 3D space. So. With this script, we had the geometry, and it turns out we also had the skeleton of the models, but not much else. Here's an example. I found uh, one construction of the title and converted it using the script. This particular one, you'll notice, is actually the whole title altogether, uh, because there are multiple 3D models that make up the title. Of course there are. Um, there's, this one's used in the little eye-catch sequences uh, that happen when you stay on the title screen for too long. It switches to a thing, and then the model, the, uh, model fades in, basically. Um, so, however, we soon realized that we'd have to write our own script in order to get the rest of the data out of this, and we didn't want to continue relying on a proprietary program, so I started making uh, the move to convert the Mac script to, any guesses? Yeah, we got it. Blender, that's right. Blender is an open source uh, 3D modeling program, really great, um, and it has a really good scripting language, so that's what we used. So the first thing I got started with was getting the skeletons imported. On the left, we have Haruhi Suzumiya. And on the right, we have a seagull. Uh, both of them are accurate to what they look like. Uh, that's what their bones actually look like. Um, next, I got the geometry importing. Um, I actually messed it up a little bit at this stage. I got the faces all backwards, and then later someone told me, like, hey, your faces all are all backwards. That's why it all looks weird. Um, and so I had to switch that around. Um, but at this point, uh, ignoring the fact that I did something wrong, I had parity with the Mac script, which is great. And so finally I decided, okay, we're going to put the textures on. 
I already have a system for extracting the textures from the game, uh, so I actually got them to go on the model. Looks great. And I said finally there, but that was a bit premature, because there's still one gigantic hurdle left. Animations. So, I combed through the model file trying to find animation data because this was the one thing uh, that is really, really difficult with this stuff. Eventually, I found something that looked like what I was wanting. There are three sections of the file, specifically. The first had a series of floating point, which are numbers with a little decimal point in the middle, so 0.0, .0 as opposed to just 0. Um, and the first entry in this table of uh, floating points looked like this, 0, 0, 0. The second was another set, um, of, but this time of four floating points, and the first entry looked like this, 0, 0, 0, 1. And the final was a single set of three floating points, which looked like this, 1, 1, 1. Now, this may seem random, but remember that coordinates in 3D space are also a series of three floating points, x, y, and z. If you add, there's the plus button, if you add 0, 0, 0 to x, y, and z, you get back x, y, and z. If you multiply 1, 1, 1 by x, y, z, you get back x, y, and z. And now the middle thing is called the quaternion, uh, just trust me. If you apply the quaternion, oh, we got some celebrations that people recognize the quaternion. Good job, guys. Uh, uh, if you apply the quaternion to the XYZ, you get back XYZ. So these are all what are called the identities of these operations. If you took uh, like any sort of math class, not any sort of, higher level math class probably, you might remember identities being talked about. One times one is one, two times one is one. One is the identity of multiplication. These are the identities of these particular operations. This one is translation, moving a point in space. This one is scale, actually moving out uh, the points in space, like apart from each other. And this one is rotation, rotating uh, an object in space. Uh, that makes sense. Anyway, so basically these identities here act as signatures um, because when you look at it, you can say, oh, that's probably the first thing in the table is going to be the one that says this doesn't move, this doesn't change. And so if this is the one that's not changing, you know this is the scale. And so that's how I figured that out. So I was super excited when I got this figured out. And I was like, okay, awesome. I know how this works. I'm going to take these values. I'm going to apply them to the model. And I'm going to get the... So, um, yeah, that wasn't quite right. Um, so, as it turns out, this stuff is kind of hard. Um, the specifics are very mathy, but basically I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was going wrong. It turns out that a lot of it was just the way I was applying the translation, rotation, and scale vectors to, um, or quaternion for one of them. But anyway, it was the way I was applying them uh, to the armature, the skeleton. Um, it took some work, but eventually I got here. So this is a lot better. Um, and you can see Kion is like, you know, he's being sassy, I guess. Um, but you can see this is still slightly off. Notice that his hand is in front of him rather than on his hip properly. And I was like, oh, this is so annoying. <laughs> That's so close. Uh, but then I looked at this one from Haruhi, and I was like, okay, actually, this is uh, not as close as I thought. This is pretty clearly wrong in a lot of ways. Um, she's like supposed to be pointing straight forward and then returning her hand to her hip. And she just doesn't do that here. So something's off. Um, so I spent, a, I spent a bunch of time thinking about this, and actually I took a pretty long break. Uh, the time to get these animations elapsed was about a year. Um, so I took a, a break of a couple months, and then I came back to it, started trying some other things, and one day I introduced a bug into my script that got the animations way closer to what they were supposed to be. <laughs> and I was like, okay, how? What did I just do? Um, so what I did was I made the bones way longer than they were supposed to be in a way that had them facing mostly up. And so uh, basically on the day of the Super Bowl, I was getting ready to go to a Super Bowl party and I had an epiphany. I was like, what if all the bones just point up? And so I got to the Super Bowl party and I did the normal thing to do at a Super Bowl party, which was to take out my laptop, open up Blender, write a script, and it makes all the bones point straight up and... 
Well, wait a second. Now you can clap. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. So her hand's on her hip. She's pointing the right direction. It's excellent. So um, basically, we have the models working now. All of the animations for all of the models are all there. It's wonderful. But remember, we're trying to change these. <laughs> So, now we've managed to get the models fully working, but we have to reinsert them into the game. This is where you begin to bump up against the limits of you don't need to understand everything in order to edit what you need. That's true most of the time, but if your goal is to create a 3D model from scratch, you probably need to understand the file type very well. A lot of that is just experimentation. For example, I adjusted one section of the file and found out that it controls the outline shader, and it resulted in this. <laughs> I outlined her a little too much. Um, it's worth noting here that I'm also spending a lot of time looking at the game's disassembly, uh, which is the machine code, right? I'm trying to figure out what it does, what the code is actually doing to each section of the file. That helps me figure out a lot. And like, uh, for example, here you can see this section here is looking at lighting. And so I found out that like whatever this function is doing, whatever it's operating on, that must be the lighting stuff. Um, so uh, basically uh, the majority of what I was trying to do though is I was trying to take the file I exported and re-import it to the game. Um, and uh, so basically I just started with one of the Haruhi models. And I was like, I'm going to export this, I'm going to re-import it into the game, and if I can get that working, if I can get that perfect, then maybe I can get my own custom models in as well. So I started by taking an original, the original model and just removing things piecemeal uh, that I didn't understand. So there was this one vector basically in the bones um, that I was like, I have no idea what this does. I'm just going to label it unknown zero zero. And it didn't matter for when I was trying to construct it in Blender. But when I put it back into the game uh, with all zeros there, it, uh, it turned out it was important for the game. Um, and so Haruhi just became a ball on the ground. Um, <laughs> And so uh, it actually did do something. Um, so basically to solve this one, I had some hypotheses. I was like, maybe this is something where it's like one bone connecting to another bone. So I did some experiments with the skeleton, messed around a bit, and eventually I figured out what that value was supposed to be. Uh, but then there was another problem that I came across. There's also in the bones uh, two address. There's three addresses. One of them is an address to the bone's parent, um, and that's basically like it says this bone is connected to this bone. I'm I'm the one that's the parent of it. But there were two other addresses, and I didn't know what they were doing. And so I was like, ah, eh, maybe they're not important. I'll just zero them out. Uh, no, they they were they were important. They were important. Um, but I didn't really get what was going on here, so I was just like, I'll just ignore them for the time being. Don't worry about it. Uh, so basically, at this point, I started attempting to export the model from Blender back into the game. Uh, the first couple of attempts just crashed the game, but eventually I got this on my first non-crashing attempt. Um, so clearly it's not quite working, uh, but it's not crashing at least. Um, so it turns out that one of the things I was missing was that lighting data I talked about earlier. The models have lighting data built into them, which is why we just see a singular black blob. There's also some issues getting the bones to be constructed properly, so after I solved those two things, I ended up with this. Yeah, there's the image from the star. We got there. Um, so um, the final boss here was those two bone references I mentioned. I essentially, essentially spent my time comparing my program's output with the original file from the game to see what the differences were. And eventually I started to figure it out. The bone connections that the game used were the parent, of course, but also the child. So it had the inverse relationship, which once I had the children in, it ended up looking like this, much better. And then the final one was the first sibling, so the next bone uh, that also has the same parent. We got it. Awesome. Okay. So uh, basically we finally have the model looking correct. Um, and uh, so the next thing is, what if we can insert our own custom model in? So we get, we're back to her, man. We're back to her. Uh, so. Uh, basically, it seemed like a good time to try uh, inserting a custom model, right? Well, we have some problems there too. Say we want to put this Anya into the game, right? Well, there's something I haven't mentioned to you yet, which is that the geometry I was talking about earlier in these models is broken into what we call submeshes. I've highlighted just the first couple of submeshes here, but there are a total of 61 of them in this model. 
So this is not arbitrarily done. There's a limitation of the model, fa uh, model format that the devs made, which is that each of the submeshes can at most be attached to 16 bones. So going back to this Anya, she's not divided into submeshes, and she has 27 bones. So in order to make it so that it would match the original's format, I decided to try programmatically splitting the, the model into submeshes. Sub this resulted in the creation of a new deity I call D Biblically Accurate Anya. Um, the issue here is that while it's not hard to split up the vertices themselves, as you can, oh yeah, also here's more worship of biblically accurate Anya. Um, yeah, I, I also, I, it's really hard to see, but like I want to point out that my censorship here is Holy Easter. Um, so I thought that was good. Uh, anyway, so basically we were able to split up the vertices fine. As you can see here, they're showing up pretty well. But the faces um, are wrong. They get messed up really quickly when you try to split them apart just kind of haphazardly. So what's the answer to this? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> this one's still in progress, and I've taken a break from this particular problem for the last couple months, again, because it's hard. Um, I'll come back to it at some point, and I'll figure it out. Uh, the time between starting, as I mentioned, yeah, the time between starting those animations and having them figured out was about a year cumulatively. So maybe I'll present the solution to this problem at the next SakuraCon. So... Uh, that's the talk, um, and uh, yeah, um, so this is our, all of our socials. We have too many, far too many, uh, but take a picture of them if you'd like, and you can follow us, and uh, it looks like we have about 14 minutes for Q&A, so if there's any questions that anyone has that they wrote down or anything, uh, yeah, you feel free to just come up to the mic right here, um, and, and if you, yeah, it's just going to be easier. Line up to the mic um, so that I can hear everyone more easily. And uh, also, my audio recording will catch you. Also, if you don't want your voice in the recording for any reason, uh, please say so from the beginning uh, of your question, and I will happily cut you from uh, the recording. So go for it. Hello. Hi. Thank you for the talk. Yeah, of course. I'm just curious, what tool did you use for acting with this Oh, yeah. So there's two of them out there. There's IDA, or the Interactive Disassembler, and there's Ghidra. Um, so Ghidra is open source. It's actually maintained by the NSA, I think, uh, weirdly enough. Uh, but um, both of them are pretty good uh, programs. I, I think they both work really well. Personally, I use IDA, um, but uh, that's what my screenshots were from. Um, but like, I think they're both very adequate. Um, lots of people use both. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, my dude, like thousands of hours. <laughs> like I spend a lot of time in the disassembly. It, it's a lot. The good news is that for the Wii game, um, there's a nice thing that Dolphin does, which is it has all of the SDK functions that were used in the original making of the game, and it's able to identify them by signature. And so I actually can um, just import those from Dolphin's map, and it works perfectly. I have So I have a bunch of those functions pre-labeled for me. But Chokoretsu, the DS game, I'm on my own. Yeah. yeah, of course. Uh, I have two questions. Yeah, go for it. So the first is a little bit more general. So uh, I'm a part of a fan translation group. Oh, that awesome. Is translating a DS game. Oh, awesome. Uh, uh, although I am an engineer, I do not have, I'm not as good of a programmer as some of the other people on our team, so I let them handle it. Got it, yeah. So I'm in charge of editing scripts and yeah. organizational stuff. Yeah. What would, as a fan translation group, what is convenient? What do you need? What can people do that like makes your job way easier, like for documentation or anything like that? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so when you say that, like, do you mean like people outside the group that are working on these things, or people within the group? Uh, mainly people within the group. It was okay. Like the issue is that there's like ten people working on this all together. So yeah. So organization is kind of. Organization thing. is tough. Absolutely. So there's a couple of things. One is that for translation specifically, there's a really good tool. It's called Weblate. And so what we do is we actually extract the scripts um, that I showed you, uh, me reverse engineering. Um, we extract those scripts to a format that Weblate understands and then uh, take the Weblate translated stuff and turn it back into the script file. And the nice thing about Weblate is that it's all backed by source control. So every single change uh, is documented and you can even do like suggestions so editors can come in and suggest something rather than overwrite changes, um, which is amazing. And you can leave comments on it and it saves all of those in a little database. So Weblate is fantastic. That's probably the biggest thing. Otherwise, I mean like most of our organization is just like, hey, if you're gonna take a file, sign up for it on this Google sheet type of thing. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, they're awful if you're trying to do it just like normally. Yeah, so Weblate's great. I highly recommend using that. Yeah. All right. Second one is completely separate, so this is purely on my own. Yeah. My friend completely disassembled the Korean port of a Japanese PS2 game on the Exchange for me to translate. Oh, wow. Uh, what would you recommend as like a thought process of how to start things like trying to find strip files, start edits, et cetera? <sighs> um, okay, so the starting point always is... Uh, searching through the entire ROM for text. So you have an idea, you make a guess of what the encoding is, like is it Shift JIS if it's in Japanese? Is it Unicode if it's a more recent one, right? You start with that and then you just like either write a program or you use a program off the shelf to search through all of the files or just the ROM as a whole. You if Keep in mind that like if the files are compressed, you'll need to decompress them first. Um, but you search through all of it looking for the text and like basically you take like some text in game, search for that, it's great. Um, if you don't know the decompression, the other technique is to search for the files in memory, like the text in memory and, and follow that along so you can get the decompression working. So that's the first thing I would say. Um, that's like always the starting place is like find the scripts. Um, otherwise, I would say um, the main thing, uh, let's see, so... Yeah, that's like the that's like the big one, I think. Just find the scripts and then figure out how the script files work, like what I was showing you there. Um, that's like the big thing. Uh, once you've done that, like you'll have plenty of time while the translators are translating things to work on other things like how do I get the graphics out? How do I get these kinds of things out? Like that's like the next steps. Um, and then as you work on the game more and more, as you sit there in IDA or Ghidra, whatever, labeling functions and all that kind of stuff, uh, you will figure other things out. So like um, for our game, I actually managed to add subtitles um, to some of the voice lines without subtitles. Um, and like basically what it was is um, in the process of trying to figure out how to change the font, um, I figured out where the text display routine was and I just called into that every time a voice line plays. And then I made a subtitle. But I would never have figured that out without sitting there for hours and hours doing other parts of the game. So it all kind of ends up connecting together and helping you figure things out. So that's what I would say for that. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. All right. Next up. Um, you mentioned earlier about um, something, a program called WPF. What oh, yeah. Why, why is it so useful? That was, okay, that was a side joke that I was making. WPF stands for Windows Presentation Framework. It is a very, very old uh, format. Not very old. It's like uh, probably 15, 16 years old. Uh, one of my uh, coworkers actually worked on it. Um, and so I like to dunk on it sometimes because it's not great. Um, so it's uh, basically a Windows-only format. And like I program in C Sharp prim primarily, which is um, uh, a originally a Microsoft language. Um, and so uh, if you're going to build an app out of the box that has a GUI, uh, WPF is usually what you end up using. Um, nowadays, I don't use it. I actually use other things. Um, and uh, yeah, but anyway, that was that was why I made that comment. It was uh, a joke that was really just for me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Yeah, go for it. What what programs or kind of things would you use to make a uh, if you're doing C Sharp, uh, I actually really recommend a couple of them. One of them is Avalonia. Uh, if you're familiar with like forms typed applications like Windows Forms or WPF, uh, Avalonia is really good. Um, and a lot of like really professional applications use it. Um, and then the other one I'd recommend actually is Gato, the game engine. It's really good for making apps. We're actually using it to make the editor for Heibetsu. Um, and uh, part of the reason we're using it is because it has 3D stuff out of the box, so we can just import models and all that kind of stuff. So highly recommend it. They're both really good. They're both fully cross-platform, which is the most important thing. Um, so they work on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, so, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, cross-plat. Yeah, of course. Hi. Hi. Two things. Yeah. What places online would you recommend for to get involved with the translation group? Um, yeah, so... Um, this is a hard question because forums are dead now, right? Like that's kind of the problem. It used to be like you could say, oh yeah, romhacking.net is kind of like the place to go. Um, it's still somewhat true. Some people do post on the forums and stuff. Um, uh, but there's also uh, GBA Temp is a much more active one. A lot of people are on there. That's actually where I found this Haruhi project initially. Um, and then of course like subreddits and stuff have things. Uh, the real answer here is join a Discord. Um, so there's a couple of different discords out there. Um, 
One of them, romhacking.net, actually has a really active Discord that has um, a full, like, huge tons of projects, people posting about them all the time and recruiting and all that kind of stuff. So they don't use the forums anymore. They use Discord, which, on the one hand, Discord's convenient. On the other hand, it's all gated behind, like, small little communities, and it's not searchable, so that kind of sucks. Um, but that's what I would recommend is, like, go to romhacking.net, join their Discord. You'll have a, a great time finding ways to get involved. So that's what I'd say. Yeah. Can we hear that thing? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Uh, how about we get the last question and then I will play the banger. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Hi. Hi. Um, I've done a bunch of graphics hacking on Wii games. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know that the fixed function nature of the Wii is like really useful for finding mm -hmm. out like transformations and light yeah. and stuff. I haven't done any DS stuff, so I'm kind of curious how does the fixed function nature of the DS help the approach your trigger? For the graphics specifically, uh, the main thing is that we understand the graphics pipeline. So the DS actually does have a 3D engine as well, and uh, this game makes use of it. Um, and so like a lot of it is like uh, when we're doing the text function, for example, what it does is it actually takes all of the characters in the font, cuts them out, makes a little mini texture with all the characters, and then draws them as quads on the screen. Um, just like the layout function did, except dynamically. Um, so understanding how the DS's 3D pipeline works is very important for understanding even the 2D stuff that's happening on the screen. Because um, like this game doesn't have any actual 3D models or anything. It's just using that 3D engine to do 2D stuff. Um, so I would say that's like a big part of it. Um, the other thing is that like a lot of the graphics, if you open it up, look really scrambled because they're tiled. Uh, the DS, the secondary engine is basically a GBA, a Game Boy Advance. Um, and so it uses like the tiling functions in memory to try to save memory and things like that. Um, and so just knowing that is huge. Like I knew that at the beginning and it was funny because it actually hurt me because the 3D stuff is not tiled. So I was like trying to tile it. I'm like, why does this all look wrong? And it's because it's just like, it's literally just like an image. It's like X, Y, Z, like, or X, Y, just like point by point by point exactly along the way. Um, so um, that's how, that's what I would answer to that question basically. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Oh, we got one more. One more. Yeah, okay, no worries. The video is like uh, a minute, so we're good. Yeah. Make this quick then. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions or resources in mind for someone who would like to learn more about IDA and Gidra using debuggers and. <sighs> My blog posts. <laughs> um, uh, seriously, actually, um, I have a, 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 I mean, like, I'm not going to say it was a, it's a great blog post, but it did go viral on Reddit. Um, but uh, I have a pretty good blog post on uh, reverse engineering compression algorithms that goes really in depth with IDA a little bit. Um, there's also a video by a person named Hilltop who does a lot of uh, ROM hacking stuff and translation who made a video on reverse engineering with Ghidra specifically. So highly recommend that. Um, it's a, it's a good video. Also, um, if you're interested at a high level, uh, you can watch the recording of this talk from last year. I talk about it a lot in that, too. So, yeah. I'll keep both of those in mind. Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. All right, guys. Banger time. Oh, wait. I can just, uh, like, go to the slide this way. I don't know why I'm doing that. Okay, here we go. Banger. Let's do it. Oh, do I have to, like, play manually? Oh, no. Let's go to the... Okay. There we go. Yeah, we got sound now. Yeah. So, yeah, logos, yada, yada, yada. Here we go. Banger time. Oh, yeah. Okay, excellent. There we go. We got the banger. Excellent. Here, you know what? Let's also play the My Melody video while we're at it. All right. All right. Uh, yeah, we've got uh, two minutes left technically, so we're ahead of schedule. Um, here's the socials again. Uh, take pictures if you haven't already. Um, yeah, that's the talk. If you have any other questions, feel free to come up and talk to me individually if you're not if you're afraid to use the mic or anything. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>